welcome you here at the University of the Bahamas. We're pleased to have you. And the motto here is knowledge, truth, and integrity. And as such, tonight, what we want to do is continue that tradition. And this evening, we uh, want to uh, present to you a dynamic speaker in the name of Dr. Art Karen. Dr. Karen is an associate professor of economics at Samford University Brooks Brooklyn School of Business. In addition, he is a senior research fellow with the Institute of Faith, Work, and Economics, a senior fellow with the Beacon Center of Tennessee, and a research fellow with the Independent Institute. His research has appeared in many journals, such as the Journal of Urban Economics, the Southern Economic Journal, Applied Economics, Public Choice and Contemporary Economic Policy, and his commentaries have appeared in Forbes, Productive, USA Today, Black Belt, and many other um, medias and journals. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Cardin. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for that very generous, very kind welcome. I am absolutely thrilled to be back. This is my second visit on behalf of the Nassau Institute. I was here in uh, 2012, which was right before our younger son was born. He's now six. Um, to celebrate the birthday of Milton Friedman, who would have been 100 at the time, uh, which also happens to be the same birth. This, he ex actually happens to share a birthday, at, uh, birthday excuse me, with my 10-year-old who was also born on July 31st. Hmm? Yeah, July 31st. Yes, yes, so three very important people born on July 31st. Jacob Carden, Milton Friedman, and Harry Potter. Okay, all three share the same birthday. And before the thing, I mentioned that my, uh, uh, unfortunately my eight-year-old daughter can't be here with us. She's been saving for years to take the whole family to the Bahamas. And my hope is that we're all able to do that uh, for the Association of Private Enterprise Education Conference um, that's actually gonna be here in the Bahamas in April. So I've been asked to talk to you about a project that I've been working on for some time with an economic historian named Deidre McCluskey. And Professor McCluskey has written a three-volume set or three-volume series on what she calls the bourgeois era. Basically, the period between the late 18th century and roughly today, during which there was a big intellectual change and a big change in how we value certain kinds of activity. Um, Several years ago, she asked me if I'd be interested in co-authoring with her a volume that would try to condense this whole thing into something that's a little bit more, um, well, a little bit more accessible than, say, 1,700 pages of very dense, heavily footnoted academic prose. And uh, for those of you who are students in the room, if someone of that caliber says, hey, will you do this project with me, no matter what you're doing, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, the answer is absolutely, positively, under any circumstances, I'll be more than happy to do this. It's been a fantastic project to work on. And over the next few minutes, the next little bit, I'm um, going to address a handful of issues. First, it's the end of the world as we knew it. So how is the world different today compared to the world of our ancestors? Second, I'm going to consider a handful of different deals, different ways that we organize society. There's what, we, what Professor McCluskey and I call the blue blood deal. There's the Bolshevik deal, there's the bureaucratic deal, and then finally there's the bourgeois deal of leave me alone and I'll make you rich. <clears throat> I'll say a few words about what, what led to this revaluation of a virtuous bourgeois life of buying low and selling high and saving and commerce and innovating. Um, <clears throat> I will apply this to a question related to voting. And of course, we just had a midterm election in the United States, and everybody was, was all up in arms about what was going to happen with the, the midterm election. But I'm going to argue that you should not blame me because I vote with every purchase I make, or almost every purchase I make, for Jeff Bezos. And of course, if you've been following Amazon in the news, 
Um, they are the recent beneficiaries of several massive handouts from the state governments of New York and Virginia to build HQ2, or I guess HQ2A and HQ2B, uh, you might call them. And then finally, I'll say a couple of things about Adam Smith. If you've not encountered Adam Smith, um, he makes what I think is a really important ethical assumption about how a commercial society works that um, I, I don't think is really appreciated the way that it should be. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things about Adam Smith. And as I mentioned, it's, it's the end of the semester, so I know you guys have nothing but time on your hands having done all of the work that you need to do for the term, so you can kind of rest in what we're about to talk about. I, yeah, I too was in college once, and, and, and the, way that I, the way that I like to remember it is I never made any mistakes. But no, no, I, I remember the end of the, the, end of the semester. Uh, pro tip, if you have a paper you've got to write, feel free to use anything that we talk about as source material for the paper or suggestions for future readings or things like that. But first things first, let's say a couple of things about how it is the end of the world as we knew it. Um, I looked up Bahamian per capita gross domestic product adjusted for purchasing power parity, and per capita, it's about $30,000, which is incredible. Okay? You divide that by 365, and you got it, it's about 80 bucks a day, I think. $80 a day per capita in goods, services, et cetera. Now, if we compare that to the world that we inherited from our ancestors, if we compare that to the world that we inherited from our ancestors from about a million years ago, until about 250 or 300 years ago, it was about $3 a day. It was about $3 a day. Now then, as we discussed in the car over here, that per capita income, or the, the GDP of the Bahamas, is not very equitably distributed, just like it's not very equi equitably distributed in the United States. But even, even in relative poverty, in the US or even in relative poverty in um, Canada or even in relative poverty in Europe or the Bahamas or a bunch of other places, people still live better in terms of their material consumption than the average among our ancestors did many, many moons ago. We live richer lives in that we have higher incomes and more access to goods, services, and stuff. We live longer lives in 1800 in 1800, life expectancy in even wealthy countries was less than 40. Life expectancy in England in 1800 was less than 40. Today, life expectancy is higher than 40, and it's in the 50s and 60s in even relatively poor countries. It's pushing 80 in relatively wealthy countries. So we, we live richer lives. We live far longer lives. We live, I would argue, cleaner and more meaningful lives. Okay. where Thomas Hobbes argued that in the state of nature, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. What the bourgeois era has done, what Professor McCluskey calls the great enrichment that happened again roughly around the middle of the 18th century and going forward, has been to create a world that is not solitary, but one that is very well connected. One that is not poor, but one in which even the poor people in relatively wealthy countries live better than the kings of centuries ago created a world that is not nasty, but a world that is relatively clean. A world in which we have access to, a world in which we can actually bathe. And I, don't think we, I don't think we recognize just how radical a difference that is between the world we inhabit today and the world that our ancestors inhabited. Speaking of, of cleanliness, dentistry would be another good example. The fact that our teeth are not rotting out of our heads is a major, major difference again between what's available to the average person in relatively wealthy countries, and I'll argue the average person in the world, and even the kings of yesteryear, the, 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 those who ruled over our ancestors. So life is not solitary, it's not poor, it's not nasty, it's not brutish. Where it used to be brutish, it's now relatively peaceful. The probability that someone dies at the hands of another human being today is far lower than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 5,000 years ago. We live, a much, we live much more peaceful lives. And where life used to be short, as I mentioned earlier, today lives are relatively long. Life expectancy at the height of the Roman Empire was in the 20s. Life expectancy at the height of the Roman Empire was in the 20s. Now granted, a lot of that's driven by very high child mortality and very high infant mortality, but even if you make it into your teenage years in ancient Rome, or for that matter, England of the 1500s, you've got maybe another couple of decades before you die of some disease that is today easy to prevent. Okay. Life used to be really, really lousy 
for the average person, of course, and then even for the relatively wealthy, considered by, by the standards of the day. Now, if you read the news, everything looks awful. Everything looks awful. I remember a couple of years ago saying to my principals of macroeconomics students, well, let's be real, you know, Donald Trump is not going to win the presidency. And lo and behold, here we are. Okay. Here we are. Okay. President Trump is president of the United States. Now, the unemployment rate is low, okay, and that's fantastic. Um, the economy is growing. That's also fantastic. But labor force participation has fallen, and there are all sorts of people who are really, 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 really upset in the United States and elsewhere about the direction in which public policy is going in, um, well, in Europe, in the US, in Brazil, in pretty much every country in the world. But what's going underreported, what's going underreported is one of the most amazing things that's ever happened. And that is, as reported by the Brookings Institution relatively recently, more than half of the world's population now has an income that we would consider middle income or higher income by global standards, by historical standards, where for our ancestors, the average person enjoyed about $3 a day worth of goods and services. The average around the world today now is about 10 times that. So about $30 a day around the world. The average around the world is roughly the average in a country like Brazil. Okay. And even though the world is still filled with, with poverty and all sorts of terrible, awful, horrible, no good, very bad things, it has improved. It has improved dramatically. Okay. And <clears throat> While, we, while it's easy to get hung up on things like inequality in relatively wealthy countries like the United States, um, what's really going on is the emergence of a global middle class and the widespread enrichment of the world. And this happened, we argue, because of a change in the way that we think about buying and selling, a change in the way that we think about commerce and a change in the way that we think about innovation. Because we adopted specifically a social deal that celebrated and rewarded people for creating value and for creating wealth rather than celebrating people and rewarding people for destroying it or for killing people. Briefly, I'm going to touch on four different ways of organizing society. The first is what we call the blue blood deal. A blue blood is a member of the elite, an aristocrat. In her books, McCluskey calls this the aristocratic deal. In our book, we're going to call it the blue blood deal because this is the, this is the social deal that says, honor me because I am better than you. I am an aristocrat. I was born of the right person, of the right lineage, and that somehow makes me special. I'm the Duke of whatever. I'm the Earl of somewhere, because my father before me was the Earl of somewhere, as was his father before him, as was his father before him, as was his father before him. You guys may not know this, but I'm descended of the sledges of Lauderdale County, Alabama. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You don't know who the sledges of Lauderdale County, Alabama are. Okay. Well, probably, probably a good thing, because we're a bunch of nobodies. Okay? <laughs> a bunch of nobodies on my mom's side of the family. My great uncle Cleet was a bootlegger. Okay? I mean, this is, this is, I am not descended, say, from gods and kings, and yet here we are having this conversation about the conditions under which societies went from being relatively poor to being relatively wealthy. In part because we rejected the blue blood deal. Okay, now that we've not done this perfectly by any stretch of anyone's imagination, but by and large, we developed, we rejected the blue blood deal and said, just because you were born in a certain place at a certain time or with certain parents, that does not necessarily make you better than anybody else. Okay, that does not give you the right to command others. Well then. Doesn't give you the, that does not give you the right to do crap like that. Okay? It does not give you the right to say that by dint of birth, by dint of birth, do what I tell you to do. When I tell you to fight, you fight. When I tell you to die, you die. When I pass in the street, you curtsy or you bow or you do whatever. And whatever you do, don't do anything that upsets my metaphorical or literal apple cart. Because if you try to innovate, if you try to move beyond your peasantly stayed in life, okay, then there will be bad things that will happen to you and you will likely come to a bad end. You might remember the scene in Star Wars where C-3PO says to R2-D2 about droids that we've been made to suffer. It's our lot in life. That's actually an homage that uh, George Lucas offered to Akira Kurosawa who in one of his earlier films um, had a couple of peasants who said basically the same thing. We seem made to suffer 
It was our lot in life. The aristocratic deal or the blue blood deal says that for everybody except for a small handful of people, it's your lot in life. You're made to suffer. Now that we can contrast this to a couple of other ways of organizing society. So we're hot off the uh, roughly the 101st anniversary of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution and the imposition in what used to be the Soviet Union of what you might call the Bolshevik deal. So we like, we like alliterations. So we're going to call this the Bolshevik deal, which says we're going to throw off hierarchy, which is great, but we're going to replace it with a different kind of hierarchy, which is bad. Specifically, we're going to replace it with a hierarchy of the party, where the central planners are going to be the ones who make the choices, who make the decisions, who decide what to produce, how to produce it, who does the producing, and all of this perhaps guided by science. And furthermore, if you deviate, or if you have different ideas, then we're not going to be particularly happy about that. You might find yourself in a re-education camp. You might find yourself doing hard labor. If you have an idea that we think is great, then you submit it to the party, and then maybe we might adopt it. But no innovation, nothing, nothing that doesn't come from the party, nothing to, that doesn't come from the central planners, because they are not necessarily better than you, but smarter than you. Okay. And they're the ones who, by virtue of, I don't know, as part of the voice of the people or whatever, are going to come together and they're going to plan society and plan everybody's lives for them, and it's going to be great and it's going to be wonderful. Except that we saw in the 20th century that it was neither great nor wonderful. Another version of this that um, uh, celebrates control, in a sense, is what we might call the bureaucratic deal. In India, we might have called this the license Raj. In the United States, it's the simple fact that I think it's something like one in three jobs in the U.S. now requires a license of some sort if you actually want to do business. In Louisiana, if you want to arrange flowers for money, you require a license. If you want to cut hair for money in a lot of places, you require a license. If you want to build a certain building, it requires a license. If you want to open a certain business, it requires a license. From what I understand from some conversations I've had, this is, a, this is um, not a unique experience that the Bahamian economy is very heavily regulated. You're requiring licenses for all sorts of work, licenses for all sorts of innovation, licenses for doing all sorts of things. Okay? What this does, fundamentally, is it allows a little bit of freedom. It allows a little bit of innovation, but it's innovation with permission. Specifically, innovation with permission from the bureaucrats or from the elected officials, from people who know better than you how to organize society. We have, cent or we, have, uh, we have private property. We don't have central planning. We don't have full-blown communism or full-blown socialism or anything like that. But still fundamentally, still fundamentally, you need permission if you want to open a business, if you want to build a new building, if you want to, um, well, in the case of, say, American immigration law, if you want to hire someone who happens to have been born on the wrong side of a particular line. The bureaucratic deal is still a deal that, that um, extols and venerates control on the basis of the notion that some people, the bureaucrats, happen to have better knowledge and better ideas and are better situated to decide what society really needs. In New York City, that might be, um, that might be a limitation on the size of soft drinks. In a lot of other cities, it might be limitations on whether you can or can't call someone to pick you up on your cell phone. In the Bahamas, it might be whether you can work. It might be whether you can open a business. It might be whether you can sell cars. Okay. Now, incompletely, beginning in around the middle of the 18th century, again, societies in Europe, so beginning in Holland, actually, then spreading briefly to England, then really flourishing in England, then spreading across Europe and then across Europe's overseas extensions, they adopted what we're, call, what we're calling the bourgeois deal. Again, again, this was completely incomplete, completely imperfect. Lots and lots and lots and lots of problems, lots of ways in which people failed to fully adopt this. But by and large, by and large, we adopted a set of rules and a set of practices and a culture that, didn't, that was not as suspicious of innovation as it used to be, that was not as suspicious of, say, banking as it used to be, that was not as suspicious 
of buying low and selling high as it used to be. We adopted a set of rules that venerated, at least in a limited sense, inventors and innovators and people who worked to make the world better. We adopted the notion that exchange is not per se morally suspect. We adopted the perspective that exchange is not per se morally suspect. That if two people are going to bargain, they both have to be better off, and that that might have some interesting implications for ultimately the development of a wealthy, prosperous, long-lived society. The adoption in this period of the bourgeois deal a celebration of commerce, a celebration of business, what uh, Adam Smith pro called properly a commercial society, that's what really let innovation get ripping. And that's what raised the, that's what raised the well-being of the least of these among us from very, very little to, relatively speaking again, quite a lot. Okay. Now what caused it? What caused it? Well, we argue that it was a revaluation of commercial life. It was a revaluation of business. It was a revaluation of the simple practice of buying low and selling high. It was a revaluation of accounting and banking and tinkering and buying and cooking and landlording and all sorts of things like that. Okay. That led from a per capita growth rate in incomes of roughly 0% per year, per year from 1 million BC up until, a, I don't know, a couple of centuries ago to a growth rate in per capita incomes of 1% or 2% or in some cases even 3% in China and India over the last couple of decades, flirting with 10%. Okay. We went from a world of no growth to a world of some growth. And again, a lot of this is due to an egalitarian revolution that came to value commerce and that came to value innovation. There were at the time, or in roughly the 16th century or so, four R's of reading, reformation, revolt, and revolution that led to a revaluation, we think, of business and a revaluation of the merchant class. Reading, okay. well you had in Europe the development of the printing press and you combine that with a very, very, very politically fragmented area where every city has its own king or every, every city has its own set of rulers and it became very, very difficult for governments to censor. Someone who had quote unquote heretical ideas in one part of Europe, say in France, could move to Holland or could move to England someone who had heretical ideas or innovative ideas or weird ideas or unpopular ideas in England could move to somewhere on the continent. Okay. With the development of the printing press and with, combined with the, the political fragmentation of Europe, we got an explosion of new ideas. Okay. Not for lack of trying did, uh, did Europeans fail to censor heavily, but it just, it just got to the point where anyone with weird ideas could move relatively easily and then furthermore, the printing press meant that 300,000 copies of a work by Martin Luther could be circulating all across Europe uh, in a matter of weeks or a matter of months. It was very, very, very hard to put down ideas. In 1517, we had the Protestant Reformation. Speaking of Martin Luther, he nailed his 95 Theses to uh, the door of the Church of Wittenberg. And we developed here new ideas about church governance, which became less hierarchical. Okay, it became more democratic, it became more egalitarian. We adopted and embraced the notion of what, uh, what in the Christian faith might be called the priesthood of the believer. The idea that each individual person is a king and priest to God, that each individual person has a dignity and a fundamental liberty that cannot be violated. That there's no such thing as a special person who just by virtue of, who they were, of where they were born um, has a right to tell other people what to do. And again, this was all very, very imperfect and all very, very incomplete, but it was enough that we went from basically no growth to at least some growth. This was then furthered by revolt and revolution and big, large-scale political change, first in the Dutch revolt against Spain, second during the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution in the 17th century, Third, kind of reaching its, its apex in the American Revolution in 1776, and then a few years later in the French Revolution. That, again, for being completely imperfect, and let it not be said that this is like some sort of happy version of history where, where uh, all of a sudden everything was great and then there were no problems. It went from being completely terrible 
to a little bit less terrible and just, just less terrible enough that we got long run economic growth. And that should make you very optimistic. It makes me optimistic. Okay. All of this, the, the inculcation of these new ideas, the development of a political world, um, and the, develop, the development of a set of political institutions that at least respected, if not always valued, liberty, led to, again, a revaluation of commercial life, okay, where it became honorable to become an accountant. It became honorable to become a banker. It became honorable to be a merchant. And this is reflected in the kinds of words that people used. And it was reflected in the kinds of, uh, the kinds of talking that people did. Consider for a second just the very word innovation. Innovation used to mean heresy. Innovation used to mean heresy. You were introducing innovation in the scriptural interpretation if you had weird new ideas, and that was, that was suspect. That was perhaps to be punished. That was not to be trusted. Today, now, everybody wants to be an innovator. Innovation is the, like, that's, that's the hot thing on everybody's, uh, on, on, on everybody's lips. Indeed, looking at the back of the room here, we've got a, hand, we've got a handful of, uh, I assume these are the principles of the University of the Bahamas. Integrity, always hold yourself to the highest standard. Accountability, be bold, lead with impact, and achieve more. Collaboration, share knowledge and learn from others. And then finally, diversity, embrace diversity for innovation and growth. So instead of being a bad word, like it was historically, it's become something that we put into the mottos of our institutions of higher education. It's something that everybody, well, not quite everybody, but a lot of people want to embrace. And it has, it has again, taken us from a world in which the average person consumed $3 a day worth of goods and services to a world in which the average person consumes some $30 a day worth of goods and services, and far more than that in relatively wealthy countries. Now then, <clears throat> again, I mentioned there was, a, there was an, an election in the United States recently, a uh, midterm election during which uh, the, Democrats, uh, the Democrats swept to a few more seats in the House of Representatives. Um, effectively, what we did is we, we developed a set of democratic ideas, but not necessarily democratic in the political sense. Democratic in that we started allowing people to vote with their purchases to vote with their money, to decide how they wished to conduct their own lives, to make choices about whether um, this product or that product, in fact, actually met their needs, and then to allow the profit test of the market to determine what gets produced and what doesn't. The richest man in the world right now is Jeff Bezos. Okay? He's worth, last time I checked, $150 billion. Bezos' net worth, $150 billion. Historically, people got rich not by doing what Jeff Bezos did. People got rich by doing what Henry VIII did, which was tax people and take their stuff. Okay? Henry VIII, during his reign, at one point, he and his courtiers were consuming 5,000 calories a day. 5,000 calories a day. That's a, hmm? That's a lot of eating, yeah. So for someone my size, the US government recommends about 2,500 calories a day, okay? 2,500 calories a day. So uh, Henry VIII is sucking down about twice that every day. Indeed, it got to the point where he was so fat that he couldn't move under his own strength. Hmm? He was also short. Okay. So he's short, he's very, very fat, he's eating an enormous amount, and he's getting all the resources to do this by taxing people. Okay. He's not necessarily creating new value. Jeff Bezos, on the other hand, is worth $150 billion. And some of that, no doubt, comes from special privileges that Amazon gets from the government. Things like a patent on uh, one-click shopping. Or again, if we're looking at, at, the, at the business news right now, the massive piles of giveaways that Amazon is getting from the states of New York and Virginia in order to locate their new headquarters, or the new secondary headquarters, in the DC metro area and in New York City. But by and large, Jeff Bezos got to be, he got to be so very, very wealthy because people like you and me voted for him. People like you and me voted for him with every single purchase that we make. Okay? Every time I buy something from Amazon, I'm voting for Jeff Bezos. I'm voluntarily handing over my own hard-earned money for books, for almonds, 
for all the sort of stuff that I get through subscribe and save. I'm effectively telling Jeff Bezos and everybody else, everybody else at Amazon, good job. Good job. You're providing us with stuff I want. You're providing my family with stuff we want at prices we're willing to pay. And moreover, your algorithms are now so good that sometimes you might know what we want before we even do. Okay. Now then, should we be afraid of this? Probably not. Should we be afraid of Amazon? Again, probably not. Why? Because who, who is the big player, and in, in a lot of ways still the big player in retail? Before Amazon came along, it was Walmart. Before Walmart, it was Kmart. Before Kmart, it was Sears. Before Sears, it was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Okay? All of these now are one with Nineveh and Tyre. Okay? All have, uh, Sears, in fact, actually just went bankrupt. People had the same fears about Sears, for example, that they have now about Walmart, and that they're developing now about Amazon. Will Amazon control the world? I really doubt it. Um, I was in Montgomery, Alabama on Saturday, actually, um, doing, a, doing a thing at Faulkner University where I got to lead some students through a discussion. And I get there, and of course I realize, like a good absent-minded economist, I don't have a shirt. I don't have a, I don't have a dress shirt. I had some t-shirts, but you can't really show up at something like that in a you know, ratty old t-shirt. So I went to Target and I finally applied for the Target Red Card. And it turns out that the Target Red Card, which is a credit card you can get, has a lot of the same benefits that you get, uh, a lot of the same benefits we get from Amazon. It's a 5% discount, free shipping, all sorts of things like that. So what's happening, and this is creating a virtuous circle, this is creating a virtuous circle, Amazon is innovating. In order to catch up with Amazon, Target, Walmart, and everybody else in the world has to innovate. And it's only a matter of time before someone comes up with the idea that will replace them all. So that when our kids are my age, they might be looking back and saying, man, I remember Amazon. You get anything on Amazon. They'd ship it to your house. Okay. You get anything. And now Amazon has been replaced by, I don't know, something else, something newer, perhaps and possibly something better. The way this works, and the way the bourgeois deal operates, and the bourgeois deal unfortunately is not perfectly stable, is it's basically accepting this idea, leave me alone and I'll make you rich. Specifically, let me come up with a new idea. Let me test it in the market. Okay? Let me test it in the market against people's willingness to pay. Not against, say, my, will or my ability to impress politicians, but against people's willingness to sacrifice their hard-earned money in the name of the idea that I have. I recognize that I might fail, and I won't ask for a bailout. Well, okay. Like I said, it's unstable, it's not perfect. I recognize furthermore that in the second act of this little drama, people are going to look and see that I've succeeded and done all sorts of great stuff and made all sorts of awesome money, and they're going to enter the market. They're going to do what Target is doing, and they're going to, they're going to imitate or try to improve on my best practices. By the third act of all of this, by the third act of all of this, my innovation will have lowered prices and created all sorts of new wealth, and we will all be better off, ultimately, as a result. Again, like I said, it's not perfect. It's not stable. One of the first things that a successful business person might try to do, and indeed Adam Smith had very little, uh, he, had, he had, well, not very, not very few, but actually no kind things to say necessarily about business people as such, because one of the first things they might try to do is pull up the proverbial economic ladder and create all sorts of rules that might prohibit other people from entering. But in Adam Smith, there's a very, very important principle and something that I, something I would like to end on, and that's a, a recognition of a very, very different way that we think about one another. And that concerns not just liberty, but also simple human dignity. In chapter two of his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, Smith has a very famous passage in which he points out that it is self-interest that motivates people's behavior, that motivates people to do stuff for us. He said, you know, think about the butcher, the baker, and the brewer. How is it that you get your dinner? You don't appeal to their humanity, Smith says. You don't appeal to the fact that they're nice people and the fact that you need stuff, rather. He says you appeal to their self-love. You appeal to their self-love. And indeed, in this whole section, that he, in this whole section in which he, he makes this recommendation, 
he points out, he points out a handful of things. First, one of the things that separates mankind from the rest of the animal kingdom is the fact that we cooperate, the fact that we exchange, the fact that we trade. If you look at some of the stuff you have, like, for example, your shirt, or your cell phone, or your car, or your glasses, the number of people who are involved in the production of these things is effectively infinite. They know things you don't know. They, can do, they, they know how to do a lot of things that you don't know how to do. And yet, via an exchange process in a market economy, you're able to harness all of that knowledge that they, all of that knowledge, excuse me, that you don't have for purposes that a lot of people may not necessarily approve of. Smith argues that you convince the butcher, the baker, the brewer to provide you with your dinner, not by saying, hey, I need stuff, but by providing them with value, by convincing them that it is in their interest to help you. And indeed, this works not just in a society in which people are selfish. And indeed, Smith is not counseling people. He's not advising that people be selfish and that people be, um, you know, that, that people exhibit the anti-virtues that we try to teach our kids not to have of being very, very selfish and grasping and things like that. He's pointing out, he's pointing out rather that other people have a right. They have a very, very important right in a commercial society. And that right is to say no if they don't like the deal that you're offering. In a commercial society that has adopted the bourgeois deal, other people have the right to say no if they don't like the deal that you're offering. If you're the butcher, if you're the butcher and someone comes in and says, hey, look, I need some pork chops, you can say no to that person if they don't offer you something in exchange for the pork chops that you prefer. Does this make you a bad person that you're selfish or self-interested? Of course not. It absolutely, positively does not. Okay? It says, simply, that you have your own needs, and you're probably the best judge of those needs. You're probably a better judge of those needs and those wants and those desires than I am. I mentioned at the very beginning my kids, ages 10, 8, 6. I love them, would die for them. I think they're absolutely fantastic. And, and again, I hope if you come to the Appy Conference, you might actually get to meet them. You may not feel about them the same way that I do. <laughs> there are days that I don't feel about them the same way that I do. Okay. But in a commercial society, the right to say no reflects the fact that I've got my own priorities. I've got my own values. I have my own problems I need to solve. And I probably know my kids a lot better than you do. I probably know my own family, my own issues, the, the, the particular circumstances of time and place, to borrow, uh, to borrow a phrase from the economist Friedrich Hayek, better than virtually anybody else. And the way, that it's, the way that society proceeds, the way that society gets rich, the way that we all enrich one another, is when we respect in one another that simple dignity and that right to be in some sense kind of master of their own fate. That right to say no to any deal that they don't want to take and the obligation then, okay, for you to appeal to another self-interest, for you to make their life better however they choose to define it in order to get the things that you want. So we live in a very, very different world, a very, very different world, a world in which the average person on earth consumes, again, about $30 a day worth of goods and services. This is about 10 times what was available to the average person centuries ago. More than half the world now is, by global and historical standards, middle income or high income. Fewer people, fewer people live in absolute poverty than many, many years ago. There are over 7 billion people in the world, and a much smaller fraction of them are in extreme poverty than just a few decades ago. Things have gotten way better, and they'll continue to get better. And they got better because we adopted this simple bourgeois deal of leaving people alone, letting them get rich, and in the process, allowing them to make everybody else rich as well. So I'm very happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I'm pretty, I Google pretty easily. I'm very easy to get in touch with. If you have any questions, comments, et cetera, feel, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. But I know we've got a little bit of time now for questions and answers, and I'm more than happy again to answer pretty much any question you might have.
I'm disappointed in Jeff Bezos because he did what nasty crony capitalists do. Yeah. So I don't think he deserves as much credit as he was. Well, yeah, I realize in looking at this slide, like I'm, I'm going to have to change the slide for probably the next version of the talk. But this this gets it this gets it at what I think is a really really important point here that it's it's easy to develop sort of two simple historical narratives that um, everything was bad, then these sort of heroic people showed up. Well, the Bible tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we get this. Uh, this is pretty clear in um, the relationship between, say, like business and government. Um, and the kinds of subsidies and things like that that, again, Amazon is getting for HQ2, uh, that Walmart has gotten from time to time when they want to open you know, a new place in different, uh, different little areas. I, I could hardly believe some of the regulations, I, and, and again, I, I know very, very little about, uh, about Bahamian political institutions, um, but I was shocked when I saw some of the rules and some of the regulations and heard about some of the, some of the rules like, like apparently, uh, like apparently, you guys aren't allowed to gamble. Like, there's all these casinos, but apparently only foreigners can gamble, or only tourists can. Is is that accurate? Or okay, 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 oh, okay. But it, but in the fancy casinos, so like the fancy casino that I drove by, like you guys can't go there, right? That's that's that that's mind blowing. Okay, to me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there are all sorts of different ways that there are all sorts of different ways that um, that uh, the world is a corrupt and messed up place. On one hand, on one hand, we see that these small changes that happened a couple hundred years ago um, made a huge difference. Where this makes me optimistic is in looking and saying, well, there's there's all sorts of like clearly silly rules in in, in various places, like again the flower arranging thing in Louisiana or. Um, you have various restrictions on the businesses that you can go into in the Bahamas. But if we get rid of those, I mean, we can, there's, there's a, we can, we can grow even faster and make our lives and our children's lives even better. Okay. All right. Yes? Okay. Let me see. Um, your definition, how, how does your definition of bourgeoisie differ from that of Karl Marx? Because in, in Karl Marx's definition, he, he sees the, the bourgeoisie as the, as the, the, the owner class. Mm -hmm. Those people who who protect themselves, you, you spoke about as right. the gatekeepers. But he saw capitalism being what exists today in terms of the the distribution of income. Mm -hmm. Because now if you look at the United States, mm -hmm. the top one percent of the pop, of the population mm -hmm. earn more than eighty five percent of the income. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how does your definition differ from his, or is it the same? Yeah, so, so Marx, Marx is interesting, and the question if, um, I, I know this is on video, so I'll kind of repeat the question. How does our definition of bourgeois differ from that of Karl Marx? Because for Marx, Marx described and defined um, the bourgeoisie as the owner class, the owners of the means of production. And there's a lot of overlap there. Generally, when we think bourgeois, we think, yeah, first, people who own stuff, but then also just the inhabitants of the towns, the middle class, very, very generally. The people who, uh, the people who own the businesses and the people who run the banks and uh, things like that. The definition of capitalism, I think, is, is, is important to really get at. So capitalism is a terrible word to describe what it actually purports to describe. Because often, um, capitalism is defined by some people as that which advances the interests of the owners of capital, or um, that which ensures, perhaps, an inequitable distribution of income. The way that McCluskey defines it in uh, the first volume of her series, and the way that we're defining it now, is it's basically it's a system of voluntary exchange of private property and free labor in a society governed by, um, governed by a rule of law and an ethical consensus. Um, <clears throat> there, there are, I think, a lot of commonalities between the way that we view the world and the way that a lot of Marxists view the world um, in that it's very easy for moneyed interests to capture the state. But I don't think that ceding more power to elected officials is a particularly good way to fight that. I think it's, if anything, if anything it would ultimately make it worse. Yeah. Um, the Bourgeois mm -hmm. uh, is suffering 
since probably the start of the First World War, mm -hmm. like a counterattack right. by the separate, the bureaucratic deal and the Bolshevik deal mm -hmm. in many countries. And in some countries, it coexists with it. Right. Uh, what are the prospects for growth from a, I would say, practical and also from a mm -hmm. moral point of view? What are the moral basis for the growth of each other and whether that will make a difference in the future? So I'm not sure I understand. Could you? Uh, yeah, that the, the moral basis for the growth of the bureaucratic mm -hmm. deal mm -hmm. is one, which is different from the okay. bourgeois deal, which okay. depends on voluntary exchange. Right. And the Bolshevik deal also has some moral implications that may, uh, for the future, okay. a change of the combination ah, of the three okay. into which one? Okay, so the question is about the it's about the moral foundations of the different deals, the bourgeois deal, the bourgeois deal, the Bolshevik deal, etc. Um, <clears throat> with the note that, and of course we're celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the end of World War One. Um, in one of her books, McCluskey refers to the period from the beginning of World War One through the fall of the Berlin Wall as the European Civil War. Um, in our book, I, th I think it's, it's, it's apt to call it Europe's suicide attempt or civilization's suicide attempt in a certain sense because it was, it was in, in a lot of ways kind of a rebellion against 19th century classical liberalism. It was the adoption of nationalism and the adoption of socialism and the adoption of the combination of the two that was national socialism. I think the moral basis, the moral basis of the bourgeois deal is all men are created equal. And there is nothing, nothing as a matter of birth that gives someone the right to tell somebody else what to do uh, with their honestly acquired property and, and, and with their person. The um, moral basis, I think, of the Bolshevik deal is the notion that exchange, exchange per se is fundamentally, is fundamentally an act of exploitation and that somehow, by socializing the means of production, we will get more widespread economic growth. Um, I think empirically that failed in the 20th century from the Russian Revolution through the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we paid the butcher's bill in the form of tens of millions of deaths in Soviet gulags and Chinese collective farms and all sorts of other various places where lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people were killed. Um, the moral basis of the bureaucratic deal, I think, is, is fundamentally very patronizing. Um, it's the notion that people can't look after themselves that the average person is a moron or the average person is a child and has to be taken care of the way that a parent takes care of a child. Uh, an example of this would be in the debate, uh, the debate in the United States concerning education, where there's a very strong, well, it's not a strong argument actually. Um, it's, it's a loud argument or a forceful argument people are making that um, since that there are a lot of parents out there who are just kind of too stupid to be trusted with their own children's education. They don't have enough information, they don't have enough cognitive capacity, they don't, have, they don't have all of the stuff that would be necessary for them to make wise choices about their kids' education, and therefore they need, they need the, bureau, the bureaucracy, they need the elites to step in and make those choices for them. Um, with respect to ethics, I, I, find, that fun, I, I find that fundamentally dehumanizing. I, I find it, it, it is an exercise in treating human beings who bear the image of God as if they're animals as if they're pets, to be kept, to be controlled, to be ruled. Um, <clears throat> while it is true that children make bad choices, and college students make bad choices, and even adults make bad choices, um, <clears throat> I think that a free, prosperous society is one in which we recognize that liberty's not always gonna work out perfectly. People are gonna make bad choices and it's not our prerogative. I mean, it, it is, it's, our, it's our obligation, say, to try to persuade people to make better choices, but it is not our obligation to step in and threaten them with violence if they don't choose the way, the, the way that we want to. But Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they will flourish. Yep. How does that factor into the 
factor into people who have not had any opportunity mm -hmm. at all, and the differences of people in the workforce mm -hmm. versus those people who are in business <coughs> and go into entrepreneurship mm -hmm. versus those who are highly educated. There okay. are many segments of mm -hmm. a society, and, and, and then you could go on mm -hmm. to even look at the aristocratic yep. people who automatically get those mm -hmm. opportunities. And my other question for you mm -hmm. is, in your thinking and analysis of this, what needs to happen so that all levels mm -hmm. of society can accomplish this premise of mm -hmm. leave people alone and they will thrive? That's a fantastic question, uh, or a fantastic pair of questions. It, it, concerns, it concerns, first of all, social stratification. Um, the fact that not, you know, not, not all people had the good foresight to be born in the right country to the right parents and things like that. You know, I, I chose well, right? I chose to be born in Alabama. Uh, okay, well, okay, it's in the U.S., I suppose. Uh, I, got, I chose to be born to great parents and things like that. Well, okay, I mean, it, it's absurd. Like, it, it is absurd to think that that provides me some sort of moral claim on the rest of society. Um, <clears throat> And then the, then the, then the question, uh, the big picture question is, okay, what do we do to help people flourish in a world where, again, not everybody, people are created equal in a moral sense, but people are certainly not born equal in a material sense or a social sense or any of a number of other senses. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, like that breaks my heart. Like it really, it really does. I'm not just, I'm not just saying that. I, I wish for a world of greater equality because there's an awful lot of human potential out there that is, that is being wasted. If we think over the very long term though, fundamentally economic growth swamps virtually anything else. Economic growth can swamp virtually anything else in terms of creating opportunities for people to self-author, for people to flourish, for people to thrive. Um, <clears throat> I think we're looking for institutions that allow for greater economic scope and greater scope for innovation will, in the long run, lead to future generations having opportunities that present generations simply don't. Um, again, if you look at, at the broad sweep of history, the average person for almost all of history got about $3 a day worth of stuff. Today, it's about $30 a day worth of stuff. I will caution this, I will caution this too. And in particular, um, first of all, people who are very compassionate, and second, people who are very capable. Um, to have a degree, or to increase your degree of intellectual and moral humility. Um, merely wanting to do well, merely wanting to help people is not the same thing as actually helping them. And um, an awful lot, an awful lot of damage has been done in the name of creating a good society or in the name of helping the least of these among us. Long story short, I think the best thing that we can do for people, the best thing we can do for people is provide them with liberty. Provide them with liberty and respect their dignity. And uh, in that, we get, I think, far greater incomes, we get far greater scope for, uh, far greater scope for human well-being. The example, the example in the American context, the example in the American context, I would argue, would be immigration. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the best that Americans can do, or the best that Americans have done in, the, in, uh, in terms of interventions abroad to raise people's standards of living, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what could happen if we simply allowed people to move from one part of the world into another. Uh, the economist Michael Clements estimates, and I, I, forget the, I forget the exact number, but um, I want to say it's something on the order of a 50% increase in global gross domestic product from liberalizing global labor markets. And I think that would do a lot more, that would do a lot more to achieve exactly these kinds of goals than virtually anything else we could do. Dr. Forbes. When you speak, you speak in terms of the long run. Mm -hmm. um, in class today, I had to explain to a student a famous quote by John Maynard. Yep. And he said that in the long run, all of us are there. Yep. What do you propose to be, to be done to alleviate some of the problems faced by the average person? Mm -hmm. Sure. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, so the great Keynes quote: "In the long run, we're all dead." I would say, in the first, um, that's that's absolutely true. In the long run, we are all dead. Um, I would say, 
adopt a precautionary principle and avoid policies that will get us to that long run faster. Um, because again, a lot of what is done, a, lo a lot of what is done in the name of, of, uh, of creating short run fixes, for example, can have serious deleterious consequences. Now I've spoken very abstractly, and, and Dr. Forbes is right, I've, I've, I've said a lot about the long run. Um, I do think we need to look at, we do, we do need to look at, at, at practical policy ideas that could, um, that would be better, say, than a lot of things that we have in, um, in relatively wealthy countries. In the United States, again, there's a lot of debate right now about, say, universal basic income. And I think there's a very strong argu argument to be made for universal basic income as opposed to a lot, a lot of other sort of poverty-fighting programs. Um, some books I've read recently, one is by an economist named uh, Marcellus Andrews at Bucknell University, and he argues for liberalization of product and labor markets, but he argues for the creation of what's basically a giant sovereign wealth fund that would purchase stock or purchase shares in mutual funds and then distribute the proceeds so that the increased gains, so the increased gains from capital would be, would be more equitably distributed. His argument is we get, we get more free markets and we were able to harness the power of the market while at the same time perhaps achieving a distributional goal. Now there might be some issues with that, but if you, look at, if you look at the current structure of institutions in places like the US and Canada and the Bahamas and various other places, um, there's a very strong argument again, I think, to be made that a universal basic income or something like what Dr. Wallet, or, excuse me, Dr. Andrews proposes, or um, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton have proposed a, a uh, uh, federal jobs guarantee that again, I think there's, there's some arguments to be made for that. Um, that would be somewhere between where we are and kind of like my vision for a perfect world, but that I think would be an unambiguous improvement over, over the way things currently work. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think you seem um, worthless all thanks for coming. Sure, thank you for having me. Uh, insightful and makes us think about things that we probably don't spend enough time. But in your idea of the bourgeois CD, right, and mm -hmm. the people left alone, I don't think, I mean, Maybe that's fine in one sense, mm -hmm. but I think it's carrying us to where you have, with the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. side being allowed to float to the top, mm -hmm. creating a difference between the haves and the have nots, mm -hmm. and I think that's causing a spread. So I think in days of old, when the uh, probably the bu bureaucratic deal mm -hmm. stepped in a bit more, mm -hmm. it tended to okay. measure the explosion right. of the bureaucratic deal, mm -hmm. and then. So that's, I'm not sure that the bureaucratic deal is the best deal that we should look to aspire to. And the second question is you say, okay, well, I can buy what I want, but it's not always true because maybe I would prefer not to buy from Walmart, but Walmart came into the neighborhood and they crushed the mom and pop store. So it's not, I let me buy what I want to, I don't have a choice because they have smashed other people, so I only have one mod left. Okay. So those two concerns are very big concerns for me in, in your right. proposal of the bourgeoisie deal and let people mm -hmm. always be able to do what's best for them. Yeah, so there are a couple of things that are going on there. The first, if, if I'm interpreting you correctly, is, is uh, a potential problem of inequality. And yeah, of course, and this I is. Think the bourgeoisie deal mm -hmm. is creating that and it's yeah. causing that to be widened. <coughs> Yeah, now that now that's that's a so that raises a question to which we don't have a particularly good answer right now, and that is that is how do we how do we prevent how do we prevent people from capturing the state and using the state against the rest of society? Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a field called constitutional political economy that I think deserves a lot more society or deserves deserves a pardon me deserves a lot more study um, in part for this. You know, how do we design institutions? How do we create constitutions that prevent special interests from you know, using the government to their own advantage and kind of crushing everybody else? Um, with respect to inequality, first I think from a global perspective, inequality has fallen. It's fallen pretty dramatically with the development of a global middle class and in particular the massive enrichment of China and India. Um, within countries, within relatively wealthy countries, um, <coughs> As societies get richer, and this is, a, this is an argument I'm borrowing from my, my dissertation advisor, actually John Nye, um, as societies get richer, as incomes increase, 
money income becomes less and less and less and less relevant as a measure of the real differences between what's available to some people and what's available to others. So an example of this that a couple of <clears throat> friends and I use is, is the market for scotch. So a couple of years ago, just for, for fun, for, for a research project, we asked, we asked Google, okay, what is the most expensive bottle of scotch in the world? And apparently it's a bottle of Macallan scotch that sells for $625,000. So $625,000 bottle of scotch. Now I can't imagine a $625,000 bottle of scotch being, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of times better than what you might pick up at duty free uh, on your way a trip to the states or something like that. So, so the so the scotch that you could probably buy at the liquor store down the street is almost certainly a much closer substitute for the $625,000 bottle of scotch than the meals say that were available to the poor 500 years ago would be f uh, compared to the meals that are available to the v sorry. To, that would have been available, let me back that up. The thank you. The difference between a cheap bottle of scotch and a $625,000 bottle of scotch is probably very, very small relative to the difference between a meal that was available to a peasant in England in 1500 and a meal that was available to the king of England at the time. So I think, so I think what, what, uh, what John Nye calls the technological differences between the goods available to the very rich and the goods available to the very poor are actually, are actually shrinking over time. With respect to Walmart, um, so I've actually done a lot of, a lot of work on Walmart. That's, that's one of my, my main research areas. And there's not really a whole lot of evidence that Walmart completely wipes out a sector when it enters a town. There's a lot of churn. So there, so there are businesses that if, if you're doing business direct, or if you are competing directly with Walmart or Target or Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever and they open next door, then that's gonna create a problem but I don't, I don't think there's a lot of strong evidence that there are substantial restrictions in uh, retail choice. Now, to the extent that there are those restrictions, and if Walmart is able to raise prices, then this creates a market incentive for people to step into Walmart's shadow. And in the United States, a, a company that's done that very successfully has been Aldi. Um, do they have Aldi here? Okay. It's, it's actually a German company. And uh, if, if, I understand, if I understand correctly, part of their strategy for a while was to actually build in Walmart's shadow. And they've done a very, very, very good job of doing that. Yeah, it's A-L-D-I. -A yeah, A-L-D-I. So, okay. I mean, I, okay. Yes, well, I think that I, I mean, following on from what you mm -hmm. said, and if we take the Bahamas as an example, I don't think the bourgeoisie deal, I don't mm -hmm. think it's allowing the middle class to pull. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's crushing the middle class, mm -hmm. and I think Do the difference between the haves and the have not. Do we have a bourgeoisie deal? Well, we have some level of it, I yep. certainly do believe so. Mm -hmm. And I do believe actually rather than the middle class growing, I think the middle mm -hmm. class is shrinking mm -hmm. and it's being squashed. Absolutely. And I think it's it's the reason why a lot of other problems are ah. developing, socio you know, economic okay. problems are developing. Okay. I mean I can't speak directly for the US, I don't live here, mm -hmm. but certainly in the Bahamas. Okay. I see that the middle class is actually mm -hmm. not growing, I see it actually shrinking. Okay. All right. Um that's 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 a really that's a really interesting interesting point and, and the question the question then that I think we would have to ask is in what direction are we moving are we moving in the direction of more economic freedom or in the direction of less economic freedom and then what ultimately is causing this causing this issue Sarah I'll give you the last question okay. you made an early statement about the definitions mm -hmm. I think you know at the heart of our problem in our country is probably the way in which those those definitions are defined. I mean, like, you know, I look at the issue of VAT. Mm -hmm. Okay? VAT means value added tax. It means that what you impressed, impress a tax on is able to support that. Now, we put back on anything. You know, and, you know, and, you know, and it's not a, and it's not so being a, I mean, me, right? How does our government go in front of a, a world body and they lay out their strategy in terms of what VAT is and what VAT mm -hmm. is supposed to be producing? And it, it doesn't make sense 
that would, you know, if there's no big sense in the real world. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, you know, our problem starting off is that you know, we have to make sure we get our definitions right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, yeah, so I think that globally, so the question here is about, about value-added taxes and efficient taxation, if I understand it correctly. Um, so I think, I think globally we are moving more in the direction of adopting the institutions of, of, uh, of economic freedom. With respect to taxes, that's a, that's a, that's a different lecture. Um, I would argue, yeah, I, I would argue that you know, ta if you're going to tax anything, tax consumption um, but I'm being told that we're out of time, so, okay, yep, okay. all right, thanks. Yep. We're, we, we tax consumption and we have value added tax. Okay, well, well a VAT is a, is, a, is a consumption tax. Well, yeah, but we also have okay. other uh, oh. um, import taxes, sorry, duty. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to see you all here and give the vote of thanks. In, in, uh, we have a new book that's coming out oh, cool. very shortly, just been released by Felicity Johnson about her father, the Black Prince of Grandstown. And since it's the, uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of the war, the big war, mm -hmm. we thought we might like to learn a little bit about a, a oh, famous you. Bahamian who's not so famous, believe it or not, but I remember him selling poppies in the when I worked for the bank. So cool. we hope you enjoy that, and thank you, thank so, you so much. much. I do have to thank a couple of our Templeton Religion Trust, Compass Point Beach Resort, are two of our sponsors that have been, without them, could, would not make the visit of Professor Cardin possible, or w w helps make the visit of Dr. Cardin possible. And you guys coming to spend some time with us is really appreciated. We hope that uh, we've opened some thought channels that uh, that you go back and do some research on what Dr. Cardin had to say. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.